the box that it came in and reverently took it out of the box and rather unreverently we thought to ourselves ripped a strip off of his um, robes that he was wearing and tied a, a, a rope around the, the drum so that uh, he could put it around his neck and show him how to play it. And it was just, you know, it's just another moment where um, he was so excited when things like that happened and when we in any way could advance um, the joys of Krishna consciousness and you were talking about how Srila Prabhupada had to train us in everything, every aspect. We didn't know anything. And your first experience was cooking, you know, something so simple. But we had to start at the beginning. My first uh, relationship with Srila Prabhupada was over bookkeeping. Uh, we had a, a dance, a large dance, uh, the Mantra Rock dance at, at the Avalon Ballroom and the night before. Uh, and <clears throat> we had made some money, I think it was two or three thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars, which was a lot of money in those days. So I got word Mukunda came over to me, or Michael, yeah, Mukunda, he was Mukunda by then, came to me and says, The Swamiji wants to see you. And I said, Oh. I hadn't met the Swami yet, formally. So I went up to his room with great trepidation. Always, and to this day, those were always the most exciting moments in my life. We were standing outside of Srila Prabhupada's room, ready to open the door. I mean, I probably did it a thousand times, subsequently, but I never lost that thrill, that the premonition of excitement that whatever happens inside this room when I go in, I, I, I won't be able to predict it. It'll be a surprise. You could never know or never tell what Prabhupada was going to do. <laughs> From moment to moment, you could never predict what Prabhupada was going to say or do. But this was, I was just shivering in anticipation as I opened the, opened the door and walked in. And there's so the Swamiji sitting in his little uh, mat on the floor with his little table and three or four devotees were there. And he looked at me with that, that beautiful grin and said, So, you have made some money? And uh, I said, Well, it was a group effort we had. Yes, we made some money. He said, How much? And I said, I think about $3,000. And that was it. The bug-eyed bug look. Whoa, <laughs> once Prabhupada gave you the bug eye look, you were hooked forever. <laughs> the rest of our lives were to, uh, meant to try to instill that bug eye look in Shiva Prabhupada. I mean, I, the, everything I did from now on was to try to get that look back on his face. And when he looked at you with that bug eye look, it was like the most, ah, uh, I pleased him somehow. <laughs> I keep a I keep a, a black and white photo. Of, I, there is a photo of Prabhupada going like that on my screensaver on my computer, so that every time I turn it on, I get that right away. And so, <laughs> absurd the world is. But he said, "Well, if you have made the money, then you must know how to spend. Someone who makes money must know how to spend it. Do you know bookkeeping?" And I said, "No." I had taken some course in, in high school, but I didn't re remember much. And then I will teach you. Come over here and sit down next to me. So I, I sat down, and he was on my left. And his, his robes uh, touched me, his silken robes touched me. And I could feel these, these vibrations, the electrical vibrations going all through, especially in the back of my neck and shoulders. I never felt anything so good. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, I, I felt like I, I, better than any drug I'd ever taken. Just, I got a buzz right there. <laughs> and years back, I'm mean, looking back at it, I always thought of Prabhupada as someone very big, much taller than I was, and much, sitting in that seat when I try to remember sitting there next to him, he always seemed much bigger than I was. And yet he was very short in stature. 
But he asked Makunda to get a piece of paper and a pen. And he very uh, patiently showed me how to take a, a straight edge ruler and make a line across the top and one line down the middle of the page and put expenses on, uh, income on one side and expenses on the other. <laughs> and he grilled me on the technique. And he said, now every day you will come here and I will teach you more about bookkeeping. So for three or four mornings, uh, I would come in and I had to have all the receipts. If I didn't have one receipt that somebody spent on $2.30 for ghee or something, it probably would be very upset. Well, you cannot, you know, th these books have to balance. So in that way, Prabhupada taught us the most practical things from the bottom. Another uh, incident from those days, uh, demonstrating Prabhupada's leniency with us, his, his love for us, his, his compassion and his tenderness, is that he was learning from us that people in the West are very attached to their pets. This was something new for him. In India, no one wants to keep a dog, right? <laughs> if you see a dog in India, you want to get across the street to get away from it. And we had this dog. Money and I had this dog. Even I saw an old clip that uh, Yadavara had uh, from the airport reading, San Francisco airport, uh, when Prabhupada first arrived. And there's my, our dog, Ralph, jumping around in front of Prabhupada. <laughs> In those days, they even let you take your dog in the airport. And Prabhupada never said anything. He never said anything about our dog's name is Ralph. And sometimes we would even go, Prabhupada liked to go on the freeways. This was something new. He had, didn't get this in New York, but in San Francisco, we had a freeway system downtown. So whenever we took him somewhere, we went on the freeway. The old car that Jayananda had donated to the temple, I think it was a 1954 Ford, 54 Ford, and the front seat was broken, the passenger seat, so it bent way back. So Prabhupada, and we had written in psychedelic lettering all over it, Hare Krishna, all over this thing, like, like Ken Kesey's bus. And Prabhupada would get in, and he'd sit down, and you could barely see the little tip top of his head over the <laughs> There. And he loved to go 70 miles an hour down the freeway. <laughs> the new experience for And usually, my dog was in the back seat. Jamuna <laughs> uh, found an old photo today. She was showing us at our first Ratha Yatra festival. It was an unbelievable photo. I mean, think about it. It's a flatbed truck, and this was shot from the side. <clears throat> Each one of the devotees, Janaki, Yamuna, and uh, the others are all doing different things in the back of the truck. And I'm behind the driver's seat, my aunt, with a big grin on my face driving, and my dog is sitting beside <laughs> 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 Finally, Prabhupada said we had to get rid of the dog, and we did. Very slowly. <laughs> He brought us up in the, in the Vaishnava tradition, and but the I think what he captured what we were what he captured us with was his sense of adventure, as we were all like young and adventurous people to begin with. That's why we were there in Hay Ashbury, looking for some something answers, some wild new adventure to take us <clears throat> someplace different. We love that in Prague. He had that sense of adventure like nobody. And what he did as an old man to come over and, and on his own, with no money, to the United States and, and do what he was doing, sit down with us, live with us, was the most biggest adventure we could think of. So he was our example adventure and the magic. We, <clears throat> we were growing up in a, a magic atmosphere to begin with, with the, 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 the drug culture of Haight Ashbury. And Srila Prabhupada loved, he seemed like everything he did was magic. He fit right into the whole magic carpet ride that, that we were all loved to be on. He attracted us that way with, with uh, 
the the, the con concept, the conception that that uh, if you just believe in Krishna and surrender to Krishna and do everything for Krishna, Krishna will take care of everything. You, you don't have to worry about anything. Krishna will take care of it. We love that. And it seemed to work. As we began practicing devotional service, giving up the things that he asked us to, everything became even more magic to the point where we began to expect it. Every day we expect, we would wake up and go, oh boy, another day of Sri Prabhupada. Because more magic things would happen. And the third thing that really captured us was his humor. He always did everything with a very light touch. He made us laugh. If, if <clears throat> even if, if you look on the, I was looking the other day on the uh, database, the website where, <clears throat> I mean the uh, uh, program, computer program where all Prabhupada's lectures are are spelled out, translated. If you if you when they put in parentheses laugh, everyone laughing or laugh. In some of those lectures, there's over a hundred laugh periods. <laughs> Prabhupada's lectures were fun. He made us laugh. He made us see how absurd our lives were and, and how, how fun Krishna consciousness was. He was always grinning and, and laughing and telling jokes and pulling jokes and in, in almost like a, a practical joking manner. <clears throat> so these are, these are some, of the, some of the things in the early days that really attracted us to Prabhupada. And, and from these crude beginnings, bookkeeping, cooking, this, that, little things that Prabhupada taught us, and very quickly, in three or four years, we were spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. So Prabhupada was expert in everything. That's, that's one of the main attractions for us in those days. Do you have any other early story? Prabhupada. And with your permission, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up past time. But uh, you know, I, I did want to say that the mood with which we approach this um, together as giving you a glimpse of behind the scenes information that you might not see in the formal Nalamrita and uh, things that you might not have heard before but every aspect of Srila Prabhupada's presence with us should be treasured by us and shared, shared with each other and I'm just so grateful. I, I can't say how in my alone hours I think of these three people that are sitting next to me with, you know, the deepest love and affection and respect. Each one of them served through the Prabhupada when he was on the planet personally with um, such conviction. If there's a 100%, they were 1,000% attached to Sri Aurora in serving him. And um, this very early phase of this Khan's history of New York and San Francisco uh, was very family-like. And I think it's an aspect of Prabhupada's legacy that we cannot embrace or glorify enough that the Vedic literatures is our mother and the spiritual masters our father. And you may have a different spiritual master by the grace of Krishna. But no matter what, if we embrace this, that we are all brothers and sisters, and we have the most exalted parents that living entities can have on this planet, in order to honor that, we should try to imbibe this mood of love and respect for each other. We will all have problems with each other. It's inevitable in the age of quarrel and hypocrisy and illusion. But this mood that Srila Prabhupada set up makes me to this day, whenever I think of one of these three people, my heart just is com completely clear with nothing but love, honor, and respect for them because of how they embraced Krishna consciousness, how they served Srila Prabhupada, how they learned from Srila Prabhupada. And um, I pray that so much for us, all of us, that we go into this, this mood, that um, we forgive each other for our faults, and we help each other through difficult times. And in this way, we'll be honoring 
Srila Prabhupada for what he gave us during these years of 1966 and 1967. Such, such an opulence, and if we don't use it, we'll lose it. And I, I just thank you all so much, and uh, I think being 7.30 is just later than we've ever had programs since in the history of this. <laughs> so, thank you all. I know, but you'll have to ask them what they want to do. servant, which he did in an extremely exemplary way. So quite often when we would travel, I would be able to also be there, and I would have the service of cooking for the empire, cooking and cleaning. And we also had a young daughter at that time, Saraswati. <coughs> so on the first group effort to Mayapur, when Mayapur was still a rice paddy. Um, there was no crunch building, no lotus building, no long building, no building, just the little beautiful kutir that is still there. That kutir is actually larger than it was when we first arrived. From mud and bricks and the straw roof. And Srila Prabhupada was staying in this kutir and the rest of us were staying in the tents. And the conditions were, I guess you would use the word austere, they were very difficult. There was one source of water besides the rain, which made everything muddy, there was one water pump. And um, so in order to do my service, which was cooking for Shiva Prabhupada, taking care of Tom and my daughter, I would have to also do the shopping. And that meant going to the treasure. And the treasure was a very staunch treasure. His main mission in life was to say no to any request for funds, including if you wanted money to cook for Shiva Prabhupada. Just to give you a small example, one time I wanted he would always say, why do you want this much? And I'd have to say what it was I wanted the money for. And I knew she would probably had like pineapple, so I wanted money for a pineapple. And he didn't want to give me money for a pineapple because he said he didn't eat the whole pineapple. <laughs> so this kind of gives you an idea how hard it was to just um, get the funds to cook for she would so after you would go through that encounter, you'd have to, at those days there was a little slope up to the road, about to sit on the mark. You'd, and there was no fence, there was no vendors, there was just the road. So you'd crawl up to the road and um, walk down to the dock where you would take the boat across the river to Navadri. And you would generally have a big argument there because they would try to as we say in English, rip you off because being, you know, the white foreigners, the newcomers, they would give you a special surcharge for getting on the boat. But I didn't have any extra money because our treasurer knew exactly how much it was going to cost, so there was no way for me to pay any more. So it would be a really heavy fight just to get across the river. And then on the other side, they'd have an argument just to, to get off the boat, you have to pay again. <laughs> and then you'd have to get on a rickshaw and have a fight with the rickshaw while well, I got the price. And then you'd go to the sudgy market and argue, and to the fruit market and argue. The whole morning was like a battleground. <laughs> and then you'd go back and the whole thing all over again. And so after, you know, 
that was the beginning, and then you would have to cook. And um, the cooking was in the back of the little, the little brick building, and I had a little um, kerosene stove, the kind that would blow up in your face quite frequently, <laughs> and um, a bucket with some coals in it. And the beautiful cooker that Julia has. This is how we you know, cook for Julia Prabhupada. And halfway through, the, the person who would give the massage would come and grab the bucket of, to heat water for Prabhupada, leaving me with the death-defying kerosene cooker. So it just made it really difficult. You know, to be, I mean, if you can imagine making japatis on a kerosene cooker, I can tell you it was not a nice experience. And you have to have everything ready exactly on time when Prabhupada was done with his massage. So with all that going on, plus trying to take care of my daughter, you know, and do the wifely thing, you know, make sure your husband had clean clothes and all that, um, it seemed like I wasn't doing such a good job. And I was meditating really intensely every day on just doing the best I could to please feel the Prabhupada. And I would be thinking, you know, I would start the day before thinking about the next day what I would be preparing for him and wanting to please him. And every day he would find some little thing that I hadn't quite done as well as I could have or to his satisfaction. So I started thinking that actually maybe I shouldn't even be doing the service because it seemed like there was always something wrong. And I was thinking, you know, considering all the trouble that I was going through, it, it didn't seem like maybe I was properly situated. So I, one day I started thinking, actually I'll find someone else to do the cooking. And as I got that idea in my mind, I started to feel a little relief from all the anxiety I was feeling from this situation. So I thought that I would tell Prabhupada the next day. And that day I was actually, I was really peaceful. I thought, you know, my problem was solved. Somebody else was going to cook and I wouldn't have this anxiety anymore. So the next day it happened that Sri Prabhupada had invited his god brothers. So I assumed that I wouldn't be cooking on that day because his god brothers were coming. And actually there had even been some criticism from these god brothers, maybe not the ones that were coming, but we had heard there was criticism on different levels about our activities there, and one of them was that he had a woman cooking for him, and so I, I assumed I wouldn't be cooking that day. But the next thing I know, he was calling me in his room, and he just started telling me what he wanted for lunch. So I thought, well, I can't tell him now that I'm not going to cook anymore, so I'll tell him tomorrow. So I cooked that day, and I remember Anand was there, and he helped me make chapatis. And um, Nan was Sri Prabhupada's God better. Jamuna was showing us a beautiful picture of him today. He was a very selfless soul. And um, everything was ready, and I was going to go in, and I pulled aside the burlap curtain that separated the back part of the uh, little hut from the front part. And I looked in, and Srila Prabhupada was at the end of the... I mean, it wasn't such a large room, but when Prabhupada was concerned, everything had a different dimension, so the room seemed much grander than it really was, it was quite small, but he was at the far end, and his godbrothers were on each side. And it was really intimidating, because they were all very elderly Vaishnavs. And Srila Prabhupada was there, and he looked just like a diamond in a beautiful setting. Now, if you have a diamond, and it's just a loose diamond, it's wonderful. But when you put the diamond in the setting, it becomes even more wonderful. And Srila Prabhupada was looking even more wonderful, surrounded by these, on each side, by his blood brothers. But I felt so intimidated that I took my sari and I completely covered my head and my face. <laughs> And as much as my body, I mean, so I got on my hands and knees, and only my hands were out, and I put the plate on my hands on the, like this, and I was walking in on my elbows and my knees, <laughs> crawling in, and I, I put the plate down, and I started to slither back out. 
And he said, yes, she cooks for me. And I criticize her. And the minute he said that, I just felt this passion because I realized he understood my mind, that I had this foolish mind. He was actually instructing me, and he was very lovingly telling me what I was doing wrong in answer to my desire to serve him properly, but I was, in my foolishness, taking it as criticism. He said, yes, she cooks for me, and I criticized her. He said, but she would slit her throat for me, and I would do the same for her. <laughs> when he said that, I just felt very corrected. My whole mentality was corrected. And there was no, because it was true, any one of us, any one of us would have done anything, and we did do anything he asked us to do, whether we could understand it or not understand it. We wanted to do it simply because he asked us. And we had that love and faith in him. And it wasn't blind faith that some people might think. It was absolute unconditional love that he was giving to us, and we were responding to that. And we knew he would only ask us to do what was best for us, whatever it was. So the next day, I returned to my cooking, I returned to my shopping, I returned to everything, but it was totally ecstatic. You know, it was so much, I, the fight with the rich old man was great. I just laughed at the treasure. The whole thing was wonderful. And I was very happy to be there in that situation, and I didn't ever think again that I wouldn't cook for Shin